Mr. Segan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. And the record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys. And uh, some of the prosecutors are present. Let's see, Mr. Orman, Ms. Teach McGuire, and Mr. Edson are present. And we are outside the presence of the jury. Let's take up the emails first. Did you have an opportunity to talk, Mr. Orman? Actually, we emailed. The email, sorry. Yes. No, no, we, we emailed. Oh, you so, emailed. Yes. So the communication was through email about the emails. Yes, Your Honor. All right. And have you come to any agreements or? Well, I think that we know where the disagreements are. And speak, speak, I, actually, we spoke in that email. Speaking with counsel, I think that they have some overall objections to the totality of the emails and then specific objections to some of them. And I think we're just going to have to have the court decide. All right. So we'll start with uh, you, Ms. Spengler. Tell me what the objection is, please. And what, what is this exhibit marked as so that the record is clear? I hadn't thought that far ahead, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what we've got it marked as. I, I'll, I'll figure that out. Okay. Ms. Huntsman will get that number for us shortly. Your Honor. All right. Judge, the defense's overall objection to the content of these emails and these emails um, as a whole is primarily relevance. Um, the court has heard before, we do not believe that the content of these emails um, are relevant to the issue of sanity or to any material issue in this case, and as a result, the probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice or confusion of the issues um, for the jury to review these emails sometime in the future during deliberations. The emails contain hearsay. Um, I'm concerned that the emails that are contained within this batch contain hearsay, that a limiting instruction is not going to um, uh, sort of resolve or adequately deal with. Um, several of these emails within this batch are from witnesses who we either haven't heard from have already heard from, meaning they've already testified and they've been released, or th their names simply haven't come up and are not relied on by any experts, um, and as I said, will not be testifying in this case, so there um, is a confrontation issue, um, uh, and we also would assert that the admission of these emails will violate Mr. Holmes' right to due process. Um, the prosecution has not asserted in any of their arguments regarding these types of emails um, regarding emails in this case that any expert particularly relies on any communication in the time leading up to um, the events of July 20th as it relates to sanity. Um, and so I think that also reduces the probative value and creates a situation where the prejudice is, um, does substantially outweigh the probative value. Um, this, they're not being presented to rebut any defense evidence because the defense hasn't presented any evidence at this point. Hold on a second. Mr. King just stepped out. We're having this discussion now at his specific request because he said he was lead counsel and we could not have this argument without him. So he better be here. I changed my schedule at his request. He better be here. All right, Mr. King has stepped back in the courtroom. Sorry, Judge, I had a phone call. Okay. Ms. Spengler. Thank you, Judge. Um, so because there is no um, identified expert or witness who relies on these um, emails or these exchanges um, as part of the basis of their opinion, that's another reason why the defense is asserting that the probative value is reduced to a point where it is substantially outweighed by the danger of either confusion of the issues, cumulative evidence, or the danger um, of unfair pre prejudice overall. Judge, additionally, um, we just assert that the you know, assertion of a defense but not guilty by reason of insanity is not a gateway to open up an uh, individual, uh, Mr. Holmes in this case, to all of his statements um, becoming relevant for purposes of trial. And I know that the court has found some testimony and some emails to be relevant. Um, and that his communications have, uh, do have some relevance and have admitted um, emails from professors, exchanges between Mr. Holmes and his professors, um, as well as testimony from those professors and from 
students at the University of Colorado. So I believe at this point any additional communication, any additional testimony would be um, also cumulative to that information that's already been um, introduced uh, and allowed by the court. Now, Your Honor, I also have specific objections. We're objecting overall to the entirety of the exhibit, but I also have some specific objections to some of the specific language within several of the emails. I will characterize these phrases or this language that we're objecting to as possibly 404, um, possibly inadmissible character evidence, and I will be upfront with the court that um, it doesn't the, these phrases don't necessarily fall directly within, you know, inadmissible character evidence, but because the relevance of the email is so low, because it doesn't go to any material issue, I think the fact that these phrases um, can invite the jury to speculate and can be confusing, um, it really substantially outweighs any uh, probative value, and that's why I'm drawing the court's attention to these specific phrases or specific emails, and I'll do that now if, if that's okay with the court. Yes, please. Okay. Um, August 23rd, 2011, there's an email exchange between Mr. Holmes and his father, Robert Holmes. Um, and there's hearsay contained within uh, the statements of James's father about his sister. I think that that can be characterized as um, double hearsay, and I also think it can be characterized fairly as character evidence um, related to his sister, uh, Chris, uh, which simply is not relevant. Uh, and we would specifically object to, to that email on that basis. Your Honor, October 30th, 2011 is the second email I draw the court's attention to. Is there, I'm sorry to, to stop you. Is there just one email that's dated August 23, 2012, or do you want to tell me the specific phrase or language that you're concerned with? And it's um, August 23rd, 2011, and I can... Seven, sorry. I believe there's only one email on that date, but I can direct the court to the last paragraph or second paragraph um, in uh, just for suggestion for make it easier for counsel and the court to refer to the emails I would note each of these emails has a a, a Bates number at the bottom oh, okay so maybe easier for counsel just to tell the court um, if they're the Bates number to specify that's just a suggestion uh, that I noticed okay thank you that's a good idea so that would be page one three five nine and that would be the second paragraph of um, James's father's uh, email to, uh, to his son. Then I'd refer the court to an email dated October 30th, 2011. I'll just have to get there, which is uh, stamped 2964. Your Honor, in this email, there's a reference to speeding and to police being lame. Again, probably not inadmissible character evidence or 404 in and of itself. Um, po possibly. I, I'm not going to concede it's not. Um, but there's no relevance, I mean, very limited relevance to this email, and I just think that the reference um, ends up not surviving a 401, 402, 403 balancing test. November 15th, 2011, there's also a reference to traffic school, and I would um, make the same obje objection with the same record as I just did for the October 30th email, but let me get that number for the court. That would be 3297 is the page number at the bottom. De December 9th, 2011 email. Simply, it's a, a question about Mr. Holmes's correct date of birth. Again, seemingly, I suppose, insignificant, but it, there, there's no relevance to the email and why draw the juror's attention to um, the fact that the university may have had two uh, date, dates of birth for Mr. Holmes. I just don't see any relevance and um, w would object specifically to that email. January 16th, 2012, there's an email exchange, or excuse me, an email that is initiated by one of Mr. Holmes' professors who we have not heard from, uh, Diego Restrepo. And that is hearsay. We have not heard from that individual. We would not be able to confront that individual. And there is writing um, contained within some a, a, a written document, what appears to be homework, um, and we would object specifically to that. I'm going to take my hand off of the speaker and look for the page number. That would be page number 4456 through 4458. 
Your Honor, there's a January 31st, 2012 email. Page number 5334, uh, this is a period of time where there's a sort of series of emails where Mr. Holmes appears to be um, looking for a third rotation, um, and a lab in a third rotation, and there is a reference to the work that this um, particular professor does on impulse aggression disorder. I just think it's um, not relevant and has the potential of being prejudicial um, and does not survive a 403 balancing test. It was a February 7th, 2012 email exchange with Kurt Freed. The court knows we've already heard from Professor Freed or Dr. Freed. Uh, that would be at page 5623. Um, the content is generally benign, Your Honor. It's simply scheduling. But um, there is a reference to doing rat transplants. And again, if it's just an email about scheduling, I don't see the relevance to any material issue in this case. So why inject rat transplants um, or information about that through this email? I, again, we don't believe it survives a 403 balancing test. The same objection relates to the next email that I'll identify, February 13th, 2012, with a page number of... Five seven four seven, and this refers to the attachment to that email. Um, it's an email where Mr. Holmes purportedly is submitting a paragraph uh, to his school regarding um, a summary report to the National uh, is Institute of Health, and it references uh, in vitro experiments on rat brains. Again, I just don't believe it survives a 401, 402, 403 balancing test. Um, the specific objection, Your Honor, is to uh, the content or the sentence contained within the summary report. It's not contained in the email itself. It's contained within the attachment. February 15, 2012 uh, is actually just a continuation of the email I referenced already, the February 7, 2012 email, so that email also contains a reference to rat transplants, um, otherwise just deals with scheduling, and that's at 5781, and that's a multi-page email, and contained within that is that reference. Your Honor, there's a February 19th, 2012 email that has a page number 5919, um, and this is a very a brief exchange between Mr. Holmes purportedly and Cami Kennedy, an administrator at the university, um, another individual we have not heard from um, who has not testified. And it just, it, it's just it deals with Mr. Holmes's billing statement. And I just don't see the relevance. Um, it's short. There appears to be an issue with the billing statement. Um, it you know, contains hearsay. There's a confrontation issue. Uh, the relevance is obviously very limited. and. Um, I just don't know why we need to draw the jury's attention that Mr. Holmes's tuition was being paid for by the state of Colorado. I believe it's inflammatory. Um, and the probative value does not outweigh that in potential inflammatory effect. And I just have two more, Your Honor, three more. February 23rd, 2012 is also that same scheduling exchange with Professor Reed, excuse me, Freed, that we've um, heard about. I'm going to take that back. I think it's a, a different scheduling issue with Professor Freed that's at 6101, uh, but it's also referencing um, work that the lab is doing with, with rat brains. Your Honor, March 26, 2012, I draw the court's attention to with a specific objection. Uh, it's regarding bad ac access, and um, I I don't see the relevance. Um, it is a single sentence to a witness who has not testified. It's not a witness's name that I'm familiar with, and I don't believe any of the experts rely on this email or on this particular um, individual who's involved in the email exchange, or it's not even an exchange. It's a single email um, to a merry mock about a badge, badge access. And then finally, Your Honor, May 16, 2012, uh, is a email between Mr. Holmes and Professor Freed. 
and attached is um, a PowerPoint, which appears to be the third rotation presentation, uh, or at least some iteration of his third pro rotation presentation. As the court knows, the jury has already seen um, a portion of the of the presentation on video. Uh, Dr. Freed has already testified, and we now do not have the ability to confront on this um, email and what's the contents of this email. We do not know that this is the final presentation, uh, so we would object specifically to that email and its attachment as well. Your Honor, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Orman, response? I'm not sure what happened to the microphone that was... Oh. Well, Your Honor, in the global sense, the emails are being offered for the defendant's statements contained in the emails. There are statements by other people that the defendant responds to in most of the emails. There are a couple, and I say a couple, maybe three or four uh, emails where the they're just emails sent by the defendant. One of them is the one that counsel just recently mentioned about the ba badge access was not in response to anything. The statements of other people, for instance, the, the statement that was mentioned about the defendant's father, are not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. They are offered to put the defendant's responses to those statements in context so the jury can understand what the defendant's statements are responding to and understand what they mean because of that. The totality of the emails, Your Honor, is relevant to the issue of sanity. I would note that the emails that we've placed in this exhibit, oh, and Your Honor, that the exhibit number you were asking would be 1227. Well, thank you. Yeah. The uh, emails that we have, have placed in here start on August 5th, 2011, and the final email in this uh, is June 13th, 2012. So they span a period of less than a year, but they span uh, most of the period where the defendant was at the University of Colorado, Denver and demonstrate, Your Honor, his state of mind during that period of time, the way that he decides to use words, his thought processes, and that is probably the most important part of it, is the way he's able to think, the way he's able to process information, the way he's able to respond to queries, the way he is able to uh, share information with other people, the way he is able to accumulate and, and put together information, Your Honor, is relevant to his mental state, mental processes, and the issues related to his plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. This is especially so, Your Honor, because of the assertion that the defense has made, and I believe it was an opening statement, that the defendant went through some type of uh, degeneration, that's my word, of his mental acuity and mental abilities in the spring of 2012. This is evidence that shows exactly what his, well, not exactly, I guess, but it's good evidence, Your Honor, of his uh, mental acuity, of his thought processes, of his connection to reality during the relevant time period. And regardless of whether an expert or experts have relied upon these emails to any extent, frankly, it's not the question, Your Honor, because the experts in this case do not decide the question of whether the defendant meets Colorado's test for legal insanity. That decision is made by the jurors. That decision is made by the jurors who will get, if this is admitted, to review this evidence, to see this evidence, and to make up their own minds about the defendant's state of mind and any changes in his state of mind during the time period from August of 2011 through June, or the early part of June in 2012. So. Uh, uh, that is my, I guess, argument about the totality of the evidence. And if Your Honor wants, I'll go through the individual ones that the defense made, unless you want some more argument about the totality. Um, no, it's up to you, whatever arguments you want to present. Okay. 
Well, I, I appreciate that, Your Honor, but I know on numerous occasions you have had questions for me, so I wanted to make sure you didn't have any questions for me on that. I don't. I'm going to have okay. to review them over the weekend now that I know what the specific objections are and now that I know what the specific emails that are being objected to are. So, so Your Honor, uh, regarding the email on August 23rd, 2011, which is Bates numbered 1359, and when I say that, Your Honor, all of these say CU02-00, and then they have the four-digit number. I'm just going to use that last four digits, if all that's right. okay with the And board. don't feel like you have to go through uh, each email one by one. Uh, you can make whatever arguments you want. I'll leave it up to you. So okay. if you want to pick some, you can pick some. It's up to you. If you want to argue about all of them, you can argue about all of them. Okay. As I said, I, I will review them over the weekend and we'll consider whatever arguments the parties present. I understand, Your Honor. I think I'll go through the ones that um, are sort of the different arguments that then have been previously made. Um, one of the, the ones that counsel mentioned was the birth date email, which is on December 9th, which is page number 3987 from the Bates numbers, um, where the defendant is responding what is what's his date of birth. Again, you know, Your Honor, this may seem trivial, and it, but it is the defendant responding to a query, processing information, and providing the information in an appropriate, reasonable format for response, which I believe is relevant to his state of mind and to his mental processes and the issues of sanity. The email that is referred to on from January 16th, Your Honor, and there's two of them sort of in here, and for some reason they did not show up as a uh, chain of emails like we often see where there's one email on the same page and the response on the same page. If you look at it, Your Honor, on January 16th on page 4456 is the email of uh, that Mr. Restrepo or Dr. Restrepo sent to the defendant with some CCs in here. And the, attached to that, Your Honor, the next page, 4457, is his write-up of this. And then 4458 is just sort of the last page saying it was sent from an iPad. The defendant's response, Your Honor, as I read it, is on the next page, 4459. And um, if, you, if you look at it, Your Honor, you can see that there is a portion of the email without the attachments, which has the same time as the email on 4456. So that indicates that the defendant is responding to that. And here, Your Honor, the defendant is responding to a criticism and I say that in the sense of a professor grading work, essentially, of the defendant's work, and the defendant is responding to that. And this is in January of 2012, which again shows his thought processes, the way he processes information, the way he can put this together, and uh, to me, Your Honor, is relevant to the issue of sanity. Your Honor, the uh, 53-54, which is January 31st, the, the, the objection on that is a reference to research that this person is doing on impulsive aggression disorder. I, I mean, if it were research on schizophrenia or something, that might be one thing. But this is not any type of disorder that I have ever seen in any discovery associated with this case apart from this email. And the, the defendant is, it's not like an indication of anything other than the defendant is interested in working in this guy's lab and has put down what the... Uh, type of research is. In fact, if you look at the next page, which is also January 31st and is 5336, you can see the defendant is using some type of, uh, essentially a form letter, uh, where he'll take most of the same language and then insert, here's your name, here's the type of research you're doing. So uh, I, I just don't see any prejudice to the defendant and it, it shows his state of mind, ability to process information and how he does that. The email on February 13th, Your Honor, uh, which is 5747, Your Honor has attached to it what appears to be, if you read the email, work product, and I don't say that in the sense of attorney work product, I sense, mean that in the general sense, of the defendant, something he wrote on a what appears to me a very complicated scientific uh, concept uh, in February of 2013, which goes to his state of mind, ability to process information. Fifty-nine, nineteen, Your Honor, which is February 19th, 2012, 
there's a reference to the defendant discussing financial issues relating to his education shows again his state of mind, his ability to understand the world around him, to respond to questions, and is part of the progression of time. And it's a snapshot in time along this continuum of time that the jury should be able to consider relating to his mental state and ability to understand the world around him and his attachment to reality. You know, there's one that I have marked in here, but I, I just can't find it as I'm flipping through. It's the uh, oh, well, before I get to that, there's last, the last one that counsel objected to, Your Honor, is fairly late in this email stream of May 16th, 2012, and it's page 8587, and this is the PowerPoint that the defendant put together. And y yeah, sure, maybe we've seen uh, uh, some clips of video of a PowerPoint, and, and maybe we don't know which version it is. Which version this is, Your Honor, is not the question. The, the reason this is relevant is because this is something that the defendant himself would have put together in May of 2012, uh, a time period that is just a little over two months from the date of offense in this case, shows that the defendant's ability to put together information in a, in a fashion that is connected to reality and is relevant to the issue of sanity. There was one more, Your Honor, about a traffic ticket. And, I think I skipped it. I know Your Honor knows which one it is. Um, Your Honor, there's no prejudice. And I, and I don't really think counsel was arguing that a traffic ticket is inherently prejudicial in, in a case of this nature. Uh, but the way the defendant responds to that issue, the way he responds to the, the query, I believe it's from his mother, about that situation, again, Your Honor, as part of the continuum of time, shows his ability to understand events, to respond in a logical and coherent fashion. And this is evidence that the jury should be able to consider in determining the issue of sanity. And unless you have any questions for me, Your Honor, that completes my argument. Is that the same speeding incident that has been talked about, or is that something else? I believe it's something else, Your Honor. The speeding incident that... Um, we've talked about, I think was in June. It may have been in May of 2012. This one, I believe, was in 2011. The second email that counsel mentioned about speeding may have been that incident, because there was two of them. Both references to traffic ticket and speeding deal with the 2011 okay. event. So not something that we've heard about? Correct. Okay. I, I appreciate that clarification from counsel. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, I uh, will take a look at the uh, exhibit over the weekend and um, We'll consider all of the objections and then rule on them on Monday. All right, in terms of scheduling, that's the other thing we tabled until now. Um, when we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, um, what I said was that the prosecution uh, gave an estimate at the beginning of trial, actually before the trial, that they believed they could put on their case in two months. And there are a couple of different ways you can look at what two months means. One is eight weeks. The other one is actually just forwarding two months and then picking that same specific date. So if you go by the first uh, calculation, eight weeks, which would be my calculation, uh, you would land on uh, the 23rd of June. That's a Tuesday. That's uh, the uh, eighth week since the prosecution, prosecution started putting on evidence in this case. Uh, the prosecution started presenting its case on April 28. Uh, if you um, do the other method and just say, well, two months from April 28 is June 28, uh, that would fall on the following week, and it would be, uh, I think that falls on a Sunday, and so the 29th would be the date, and that's a Monday. And what I had stated a couple of weeks ago is that my preference would be that we... Um, try to use the 23rd, Tuesday, June 23rd, as a deadline for the prosecution to finish its case. 
I think Mr. Brockler um, had advised the court at that time that in all candor he wasn't sure if that was going to happen, but that uh, at least as I understood his comments, he was, um, I think, um, fairly confident that he could do it by the following week. And so what I told Mr. King was that at least as of a couple of weeks ago, he should plan on starting his case probably on June 30 or somewhere around there. Uh, June 30 uh, or July 1st perhaps even, um, but that we would talk about this further today and that was at the request of um, the people. The people said they would, be, they would be in a better position to address this uh, today as opposed to two weeks ago. So, Mr. Brockler, where are we? Do you think it's going to take you two weeks uh, or three weeks to finish your case? You, you can either go to the podium or, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. I think right now, Your Honor, we believe that we can be done two weeks from today. And if I just said something crazy, someone around here will tell me that. I'm sorry? Ms. Tish McGuire has said I should say the 23rd. But I, I think there may be a chance we're done on the 19th, but no later than the 23rd. No later than the 23rd. I understood it. It's by the, by the 23rd. All right. So the 23rd uh, is a Tuesday. Um, so um, the question is, do we leave a little bit of time to offer arguments, the motions that may be made at the end of the people's case, or do we think that the defense can start with its case on June 24th? And I'm looking at the people, too. Uh, how confident are you that you're going to be done by the 23rd um, and that we can take care of any motions on the 23rd? I'm pretty confident we'll be done, Your Honor, but as the court might know, we can't control it all and, and not set in stone, but I, I'm pretty confident. Okay. All right. Mr. King, can you start your case on June 24th? Have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. And the other question is, Mr. King, you had estimated that it would take you a month to put on your case. And when I say you, I don't mean just you. I mean you and your colleagues. And later you told me that given some of the witnesses the prosecution has called, that it's going to be less than a month. And so if you would give me a modified or revised estimate as well, please. Yes. Judge, um, I can tell the court that it would be my preference, just because we've set things up um, thus far, um, to begin on the 29th. Um, it would solve a lot of logistical problems for us. Um, if the court is insisting, I think we probably could make a go of it on the 24th or the 25th. Um, I, I'll let the court know that m my problem is, and, and to answer the court's second question, I'm estimating two weeks at this point, perhaps a little shy of two weeks. Okay. Um, my problem is, Your Honor, is not with, we have a number of lay witnesses, the vast majority of which are local witnesses. Those people are not such a problem. The people that are in issue are the expert witnesses, both from CMHIP and from um, uh, our retained experts who are in Chicago and uh, Philadelphia and trying to work around their schedules and I've been trying to work with them uh, but they're very busy so I think we could probably make it work if I could fill I think I could fill that week and into the first few days with the lay witnesses and I can probably get the expert witnesses here late the week of the 29th is my guesstimate, um, if that's what the court prefers. Um, as I said, my preference would be to start on the 29th, given the fact that we are ahead of schedule um, and that my case I'm now predicting is about half as long 
as I originally predicted. The problem with starting on the 29th is if the prosecution ends on the 19th, now we're taking 10 days off. And, I'm, you know, these jurors have, have put their lives on hold. I'm not doing that to them. That would be 10 days? or the... days, right. Whatever I may have said, 10 days is what I meant. I'm sorry. So that would be 10 days, right? You're, you want to start on the 29th? The 29th would be the following Monday. That would be... June 19th to June 29th is 10 days. Oh, oh yes. You're right, Judge, right. including the weekends. Yes, yes. Right. That's taking a whole week off. I'm not. I'm not inclined to take a whole week off. So, um, as I said, this is a difficult thing that we've asked these jurors to do, and I think we owe it to them to move it along. And I appreciate the parties doing that so far, but I want to keep us ahead of schedule. So I understand your logistical concerns, especially with respect to your witnesses who are out of state. So I'll work with you. Uh, what if we start on June 25? If the people are ending on June 23, we could use June 24 for any arguments we need, or we could take June 24th off. You can take, you can start on June 25. That's only a few days that week, and then uh, you can try to fill that uh, the next week. You s it sounds like, and then uh, start calling your experts at the end of that week of the June 29th. I think um, that is workable, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, and I'm more than willing to try to do that. Um, if I could just have till Monday to verify with my experts their availability. It looks like I spoke to Mr. Bishop, and he's indicating that it looks like they would be available uh, during that time frame. So I think we're going to be okay, but I would just need to verify with Great. Them. I appreciate that. All right. That's the plan, then. The defense will plan on starting its case on June 25. The people will plan on finishing its case uh, no later than June 23rd. And then we have June 24th to play with if we need it for uh, any work that we may have to do outside the presence of the jury. Your Honor, I've been told that um, once uh, Dr. Metzner concludes, when we know that part ends, if it's Tuesday or something, we will be able to give the court a precise date by which we'll be done. That's the, the biggest unknown right now. So you're calling Dr. Metzner then on Monday? That's the plan, yes, sir. Okay. All right. But... Uh, you're telling me right now that you're confident that you'll be done by June 23rd, right? Yes. All your colleagues are saying yes. I'm assuming that's a yes. Yes. They were not the ones that recently got beat up, but yes, I, I will commit to that. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else in terms of schedule? No? Anything else that we need to talk to? The, by the way, the one juror is running late and... Uh, said that she would try to get here by 3.45, although traffic was bad. So, um, as it turns out, if she gets here by 3.45, that would be perfect. Uh, if she's a little bit later than that, you know, we'll obviously have to work with it. Anything else on behalf of the people right now, Mr. Brockler? Oh, Your Honor. All right. Anything else on behalf of the defense? Yes, Your Honor. I just have a quick administrative yes. matter relating to the exhibit numbers. I just wanted to be clear, and I can work this out with your staff as well, okay. but going forward, um, we would like to make sure that when a defense exhibit is marked with a certain number and it's tendered and rejected and it's not ultimately admitted into evidence, we would like to make sure that we mark each of those with a court exhibit number, but that it also retain that same defense exhibit number kind of the same way that you know, when a prosecution exhibit number 56 doesn't come in, it keeps that number. It's not like their internal numbering system changes or anything like that. And then it gets a court exhibit number. So that, just to help us keep track internally as well of the exhibits that we are marking and, and at least attempting to admit, if that's okay with the court. Absolutely. And that's how we've been doing it. And that's how we should continue to do it so that the record is completely clear Great. about what exhibits were. Um, proffered and rejected and then marked as a court trial exhibit as a result. So I think we might have a little bit of confusion and some renumbering to do from this morning. Hopefully we'll be clear going forward, but okay. Mr. King had a stack of um, those video clips that he had marked as 25 through 52 or something like that. And then we ended up making another exhibit 25, then we didn't admit that one, then we made another exhibit 25. So I can try to sort it all out with your staff, but I just wanted to make sure we were kind of clear on the plan going forward and just in terms of the numbering. That's fine. That's, um, that makes a lot of sense. Now, in terms of the ex exhibits that um, the disks 
that you're talking about, Mr. King only uh, used two of them. Do you want to still mark all of them? Yes. I think, because we may be using them with other witnesses as well, so I think it makes sense to give each of those discs both a defense number as well as a court's exhibit number. Well, my preference would be to mark the ones that you actually use. I mean, those are the ones you're moving to admit. You're not moving to just admit the whole thing without asking any witnesses any questions about them, right? I don't think that would be appropriate. So to the extent that what you're asking is that when you question a witness about a particular clip, that that clip should be admitted into evidence, then it should be marked at that time with whatever defense exhibit number, and then we'll mark it as a court trial exhibit number as well to show that it was offered but rejected. Does that make sense? I, th I think so, yes. I think this morning Mr. King did try to move, did offer all of those clips into evidence and they were all Well, I, th I think That's what he reflection. said was that he was, at least the way I understood it, was that he was going to use them or he might use some of them. Now, I don't think you get to just say, I have all these clips, I'm not going to ask any witnesses any questions about him, I just want to introduce him into evidence. That, I don't think that's the way that would work. So, to the extent that there are any clips that you want to use with any witnesses, and you want those admitted, then I think they should be marked at that point, and mark them as an exhibit, um, defense exhibit number, and as a court trial exhibit number. Now, if you want to mark them in advance, that's fine, as long as you keep track of whatever numbers you've used so that when you get to other exhibits we don't get the situation that we had earlier today where he used a number that had already or a couple of numbers that may have been used already so just just so I'm clear the clips have all of the clips that Mr. King tried to move into evidence this morning been marked as courts exhibits yet they shouldn't have been they shouldn't have been marked yet and to the extent they were then they have been improperly marked okay. I am only gonna mark the ones that you actually use Okay. Because those are the ones that I'm understanding you would move into evidence. And I'm not going to require you to say every time we move it into evidence. I mean, it's up to you. If you want to do it in front of the jury, you can. But the understanding is, to the extent that you use it with a witness, I already know that you want to introduce it into evidence. And the record is clear that that's my understanding. understanding that any clips that you use with a witness, you want to introduce into evidence. And my ruling is you can use it with the witness in questioning the witness, but you cannot admit it into evidence. Uh, any clips that you don't attempt to use with a witness, that they're just clips that you made copies of, those are not uh, part of the record and should not be part of the record. So they should not, uh, to the extent you want to mark them as defense exhibits on your own, you can in, in advance, but we should not mark those as court trial exhibits yet. Okay. okay. We'll put our heads together, and I'm, if, with the court's permission, if I, excuse me, can confer with your staff, we'll get it sorted out and make sure we have, we're all on the same page as far as numbers then. Not only with my permission, it's my request. I, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, so I'm glad that uh, you brought it up. Very well, and we'll communi obviously communicate it to the prosecution as well. Yes. Thank you. Just, just uh, an observation that we, when we prepared our exhibit list, we numbered anything we thought we might use, some of which we're not using, so there's gaps in our numbering, and if the d defense wants to use a similar system, we obviously don't object. We don't think everything has to be sequential. Right. They can be skipped. Right. Okay. All right. Anything else? Mr. Brockler, any more sulking that you want to do? <laughs> Your, your lackey didn't come down on you for uh, talking so much about Justin Bieber, okay, and having everyone then talk about it as well. All right, we're going to be on break. As soon as the juror gets back, then we'll get started. The court will be in recess.